Welcome to another Lore You Should Know. That is the segment where we delve into little bits of Dungeons & Dragons history or lore uh, for your edification or for you to use in your game or just for fun, because we like to do it. Uh, I am Greg Tito, and I'm joined by Chris Perkins. Hello. How are you doing today? Groovy. We are going to talk about strange fiends today. There are fiends out there that you know. Uh, they're they're extraplanar beings. Uh, they're demons and devils and yugoloths, so some of the larger catch-alls of those them. Are, those are the ones most people think of the first yeah, that pop in the head as soon as you say the word fiend. Exactly, yeah. but there are some categories that are strange. Don't yeah, fit into those they're, categories. They're, they're the fiends that aren't devils, demons, or yugoloths, and we're going to talk a little bit about a, a few of them, a, a three of them today. A and three, a triad. Technically four. Uh, there's night hags, there's rakshasas, mm. And there's succubus slash incubus. Ah, that's the technically four. Yes, Got it. yes. And the reason we're talking about these, of course, is because descent into Baldur's Gate, descent into Avernus, is going to be out soon. We had a big event down in LA about it, and this is timely because these creatures show up. They do. They do indeed. Uh, there's Rakshasa uh, is uh, leading the traveling emporium. Mm -hmm. uh, Mahadi, right? That Mahadi. Is, yeah. Yes. That is that is a, a one yeah out the there. traveling the uh, wandering emporium is this market that basically travels around the first layer of hell, and uh, they use soul coins as their currency among other things. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about rakshasa first. Why don't we, why don't we jump? Okay. In? Um, well, rakshasas have have been around on Earth in lore long before Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, okay. They they come out of uh, uh, East Indian. East Asian myth as these um, specters or apparitions or demons that um, can alter their likeness to look like someone you love or trust. Mm. And um, in D&D, &D, they first showed up in the first edition monster manual. Okay. And were very, very tough monsters to fight because they have near spell immunity, which means wizards are very unhappy <laughs> when, when a Rakshasa shows up because most of their magic isn't going to do boo to the creature. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, they have one Achilles heel, and that is the blessed crossbow bolt. Um, they don't like being shot with those and can be more easily killed by them. And that, those two elements, they're hyper magic immunity and their vulnerability to such weapons has carried them forth steadily through many editions. In fact, of all the many creatures we've talked about in Lore You Should Know, Rakshasas mechanically have changed remarkably little over the years. Interesting. We've been really steady with them. We've also been very steady about their appearance, and that is, in their natural form, we sort of paint them as uh, erudite, well-dressed, tiger-headed humans. Tiger-headed, I think, is a nod back to their mythical origins mm. on Earth. Is that how they were portrayed in... in, in Their portrayals Asian vary myth? wildly. Um, but it, yes, there, there, are, there are documented portrayals of them having uh, feline features. Features. All right, that makes sense. Um, what about the backwards hands? Okay, that, that is a little unclear and murky, but we, I believe, based on my research, that that is unique to D&D. &D. Got it. Um, that's I, un, it's like disconcerting when you really think and about yes it. and that, that really is the key to their um, I think part of their charm is these backwards hands because when you see it portrayed in an image you just instinctively know that doesn't look right yeah. it looks like a mistake and so it is unsettling um, but that's part of its charm is their hands look like they were placed on the wrong wrists Yeah. so um, you know their thumbs are Pointed the wrong direction. Pointed the wrong direction. Pointing and in. their hands bend the wrong way. Yes. So when they attack you, if they're, they don't claw like this, they claw like this. Ugh. That's so uh, strange. Sort of to think about. Yeah, it's so, it's so weird, but it's such a, um, a remarkable detail because no other monster has that. Yeah. Anything close to that. No. I mean, it, it, it reminds me of uh, horror movies or things like that that take something that looks humanoid but just shifts it a yes, little bit. You know? Correct. I'm thinking of the um, Pan's Labyrinth monster that had the eyeballs yes, and the palms and the hands, of the hands right. and things like that. Or like just something Yeah, just queasy. It makes it, it. Yeah, it makes it. It's makes like it. an uncanny valley type thing. Right, yeah. And now that's not to say that all Rakshasas have carried that motif forward. Actually, in uh, third edition, in the Monster Manual 3 and in Eberron, 
the first incarnation of Eberron, we there were Rakshasas that had normal hands. Oh. But I don't think that there was something then about that that didn't feel Rakshasa-like about them. The Zakia Rakshasa, which was in Eberron, and um, the Rakshasa that showed up in Monster Manual 3 uh, for 3rd edition, neither of them had it. And at that point, you've got what, a were-tiger. <laughs> because, right. because where tigers and rakshasas visually are competing for the same space because a where tiger is based, in their hybrid form is a tiger headed human humanoid right yeah. yeah so put them side by side and you can't tell the difference you wouldn't be able to do it in lineup yeah you twist the hands around right so that was probably what i would consider a rare sort of misstep in, in monster evolution got it makes sense but the, but mechanically they how does immunity what is it about the the crossbow bolt that is specifically uh vulnerable to them um it's like the vampire stake right it's just the thing that sort of trickled down through myth and lore um uh all 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 sort of monsters of that nature have the vice the thing that's going to cripple them right um, and that's that's its thing. But it's not an arrow up from a bow it must be a crossbow bolt. In the first edition it was a, it was strictly a crossbow bolt. Uh, it has evolved to be basically any projectile, any weapon. magical projectile, blessed projectile, wooden, typically thing. Um, Got it. And and the slight and the effects of that arrow are slightly different. Like in some editions, it may not be instantly lethal, but debilitating, things mm-hmm. like that. But that's the thing that really sort of gets the edge over the creature, right? And they all are spellcasters as well. Right? That's the other thing about rakshasas is they are considered masters of illusion, mm. and so. When they show up in adventures, as one of them did even in Ravenloft, they are always putting their illusion, illusory powers to work. And so they will appear to you in the guise of something else. You almost never see a Rakshasa in its true form unless you catch it by surprise. Right. Yes, which I love. I love that idea that they're, I mean, it's like a, that doppelganger yeah. idea that like anybody Correct. you but meet. But unlike a doppelganger, which is actually transforming itself physically yeah. into a creature, a Rakshasa isn't transforming. It is merely putting an illusion of somebody else over itself. So if you were to reach out and touch it, you would feel that it is not what it appears to be. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And so shaking a hand or something like that. Right. Tricky. Yes. The Rakshasa would have to kind of do this. Oh. To shake your hand, which would be weird. It, yeah. So it must feel yeah. weird. Okay. That's an important detail. Yeah. As I'm playing uh, or I'm running a Dragon Heist uh, campaign uh, in Troll Skull Alley. So okay. Like, how do I... How yes. do I show things that are unsettling without giving away the game? Right. Yes. Yeah. So that's one way you could do that. Yeah. All right. Good to, good to know. Yeah. Uh, so, and they're also not just illusion magic, but they also uh, cast spells somewhat innately, uh, mm-hmm. offensively too. Yes. Right? Yeah. They, they, most of their power is probably in their spell casting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the good thing is, if you're an if you're a DM, and and you think about it, you could customize that spell list and create rakshasas that favor that have different innate spells than the ones that are actually listed. And that I know sense. people who have done that, and that's totally cool. Um, and because they're fiends, they're very comfortable on other planes. Yes, yeah, they gravitate to the lower planes, obviously, uh, because they're super smart. They're good at they they like to hang around devils mm-hmm. uh, and make deals and all that kind of stuff. When you kill them, they go back to the nine hells and reform, even though they're not devils. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yes. So they they get uh, reincarnation is a big thing in a lot of Eastern cultures of our world. Yes. And the Rakshasas sort of fall into that, that they do have this sort of reincarnation thing where they just keep coming back and coming back. So a Rakshasa whom you killed might return to haunt your grandchildren. It's that idea of there, there be, it being a familial bond that exactly. is constantly being... Yeah, oh, and they, never, they, they hold a grudge and um, are patient. So you... Vengeful? Vengeful, yes, but smart. Mm. You know, they won't throw their self wildly into a situation where they're overmatched. Very crafty. Among the craftier, more um, sort of flexible villains, monster villains, you could hope to meet. Yeah. And yeah. they are generally neutral evil, is that right? Or are they uh, I think they're lawful evil. Lawful evil. So yeah. that's why they enjoy yeah. the devils and the contracts and things like that. Yeah. Uh, all right, that makes sense. Um, but they all aren't necessarily um, adversaries. Correct, because Rakshasas think about big picture. They live forever. Yeah. They're basically immortal. Um, and so if someone can help them today, they're not going to just not think about that based on who they're dealing with. Mm-hmm. They don't care if they're making a deal with a devil or a paladin, yeah. frankly. As long as they're getting their long-term plans and needs satisfied, they'll deal with anybody. Uh, and so 
they can seem quite benign. Mm-hmm. And the na- because they're smart and there's, they, they're confident in their own powers, they don't think that they don't have anything to prove. Right. And if they're hungry, they'll just, you know, eat something that's easy to kill and not risk <laughs> their very existence and their future plans on, you know, picking on the guy in plate armor or the, the wizard with the staff of the Magi. Yeah, they'll use them against them f- to further their own ends. Right, right. yes. Um, and because they have illusion magic and are very deceptive mm-hmm. and, and very but intelligent. Even when, even when they're caught and revealed for what they are, they'll try to turn it around and saying, yeah, I know you, I deceived you, but let's put that behind us. Let's think about the future together, that yeah. kind of thing. What can I do for you? Exactly. Right, interesting. All right, well, let's uh, move on to Night Hags. Night Hags, uh, favorite monster of a number of folks in house. Yes. Uh, Jeremy Crawford among them, who has brought the Night Hag Mad Maggie from Baldur's Gate Descent into Ruins to life recently. Yes, that was awesome. Yes. So, Night Hags are in the family of hags, but unusual because they are the only hags that are fiends mm-hmm. as opposed to fae. And that's largely stems from the fact that they are denizens of the lower planes. Uh, they favor the neutral evil planes. Uh, Hades. Is a favorite hangout for them. They like the gloom. <laughs> they like uh, to just chill. Yeah, exactly. So hags being what they are, uh, evil to the core, possibly some of the most evil creatures in the D&D multiverse. Mm-hmm. They delight in turning the beautiful into the ugly, into turning the happy into the miserable. Um, and in Night Hag's case, turning the evil into larvae. Larvae of what? Yes. So a larva is a, in D&D isn't just like a maggot or something like that. Is it, it is a monster. It is a type of monster. Mm-hmm. It is the reduction of a human soul into the body of a four or five foot long maggot with, a, with the face of the person it once was, Ugh. but sort of twisted and evil and drooling and corrupted. So four or five, it's about as long as this table. Correct. Yeah. It's a squirming whitish yellow maggot with their former face attached to it. And what a larva is to a night hag is... Treasure, uh, because larvae can be used to create all sorts of evil artifacts and things, including liches' phylacteries mm. and uh, demon warding talismans and other things. You can basically <laughs> reduce them down, put their magic, put put what the, put their essence into a magic item and empower it indefinitely. And so they they corrupt humans. They then capture their souls in a soul bag to take to Hades to be turned into larvae. Mm-hmm. And then the larvae they sell, basically like on a stand, at a at a bazaar somewhere in the lower plains. Get your turkey legs. Get your turkey here. legs here. Get your larvae. Make your own phylactery. So are they yeah. like the monster version of a soul coin? A little bit, yeah. And they're all about deals, as many hags are contracts, as yeah. many hags are. Uh, That's and, a theme. Yeah, and so <laughs> they are unpleasant because you know, as soon as you start to enter a deal with a night hag, you're already on a slippery slope. Yeah. And things are only going to go downhill from there. Right. But people do it out of desperation or because they're too evil and too self-centered to care or believe that they could suffer any possible. Or they think they're depression. somehow going to get the best. Yeah, of or they're going to get the somehow. best of the hag and all that. Um, but the hag, now night hags are, are unique among hags because they do have some unique thing, magic items that no other hags have. I mentioned the soul bag, yeah. which is this black sack where they you know, shove souls in to carry around with them. When they, and the souls is that they actually just put people in, yeah. and their souls is what's what's in yeah. there. Yeah, or they put their larva that they farm in their in these big sacks, like a Santa sack, and pff, sling it over their shoulder and march through town. Is it an actual uh, um, like a bag of holding, like where it's in, extra uh, it's, space in there? Uh, and it's not really extra dimensional, but we sort of defined it as kind of a stretchy bag that can uh, fit multiple larvae yeah. in there. So it's as big as the hag needs it to be. Got it. Really. Um, so if you want a big Santa sack. Slung over your hag's back, that's fine. If you want it more of a small... with maggots? Yeah. If you just want it to be more of a small little bag with the souls just as ephemeral spirits trapped inside them, you can vision it that way. Got it. Uh, We we have never actually... We very rarely have ever shown a bag um, of that nature before, which makes... Which begs... Begs me now to think about maybe doing that. We got to get some concept illustrations making that thing happen. The other item that a hag has, very important... Um, to her and her potential security is a heart stone. Ah. It's a black gemstone that she has to fashion herself, and it is the device that allows her to turn ethereal, which is something that night hags do and other hags generally don't, is they walk the ethereal plane. And they Mm -hmm. do that to avoid contact with people they don't want to talk to. 
um, but also to surprise people in the middle of the night. Um, they'll they'll phase out of the ethereal plane while you're sleeping and ride you, mm. like those old paintings you see of, you know, witchy witchy crones riding sleeping people in their beds. Yeah, and then that that and that's what that's a nightmare haunting thing that they do while you're sleeping. They're basically infecting you with dreadful nightmares that leave you exhausted and tired and ripe for bad decision making and <laughs> uh, cutting deals and all the rest of it. So, and there, I mean, there's a lot of uh, paranormal things in our own world that are explained away by night terrors and yes. things that that you know in medieval times or times before there was enough science to understand these things where mm-hmm. there was no explanation for why someone could be in a semi dreamlike state, right. but feel paralyzed and unable yes. to move. And their yes. conception of this was a hag holding down their arms and doing this to precisely. Them. And that's essentially the function that the night hag serves. That's we have taken that mythology and embodied it in this creature. Yeah. It also uh, embodies things like, you know, the, the, the witch scares of Eastern America where, Men would say that, you know, these witches would come to them in the night and in various forms and, you know, do, do things, things to them. <laughs> yes. Uh, things like that. that. That is also sort of what the night hag encompasses. So right. very dark. It is very dark, as well as like the taking of, of, yes. of, of something without permission. Correct. Right. Correct. And if you've read Volo's Guide to Monsters, you know the other thing about hags, uh, night hags included, and that's how they propagate. And we've actually talked about this on a previous lore, so I won't we go have. into too much, but... The way a hag creates another hag is to abduct a child and uh, basically trans or um, and then uh, um, abduct a child, an unborn child, and then give birth to it themselves. Right. And then this changeling is then delivered back to its earthly mother. Mother's oblivious. Right. It just raises the child as a girl until the girl turns of an age. When right. she her powers start to manifest, and then hag qualities start to set in, and then the hag comes back and takes her away. If you want to uh, see a version of this story being told, watch Deborah Ann Wall's yes. uh, adventure from the Stream of Many Eyes. Yes, uh, Briarcleft uh, Manor, mm-hmm. I believe it's called. So, yeah. yes, uh, uh, very interesting. And that, but and night hags has to do that as well, right? They're, yes, that's, that's how yeah, they, they do, yeah, themselves exactly. as well. They do, and that's if if they want to make their own coven, they often make right. it out of daughters that they've. Um, seized from mortals. And what is it about the heartstone? Is is there? Is it like a phylactery? Uh, no, it's it's just it's literally a talisman. Um, it's just this black gem that is the is the thing that the hag must have to transit from one plane to the ethereal plane. And oh, that's again. what they use to phase. Yes, got it. Okay. Without the gem, they can't phase to the ethereal plane, which is their their go to escape if things go awry. So that's one way for if you're an adventuring party dealing with with a, a night hag is to destroy the heartstone, Correct. and then it's trapped on this yes. plane, and then you, you'll yes. more yeah. be able to yeah. trap it down. All right, that makes sense. Now, All in right. terms of lore, we've got a number of hags that have shown up over the books, but the most recent one we mentioned at the start, Mad Maggie. Yes, she lives in Avernus, as some hags do, um, in the wastelands, and is one of the marauding warlords who ride around on infernal war machines. And she's got an entire war band to back her up, and a garage where she builds and repairs war machines. And she's not sane. She's not sane. She's got a fiendish flesh golem who's quite nice named Mickey and (laughs) a pair of imp companions named Pins and Needles and then a cadre of other manic and macabre creatures. Excellent. Uh, So uh, the final... uh, other planar being we want to talk about was the succubus slash incubus. Succubus slash incubus, which is got a fascinating history through D&D. Um, in the first edition monster manuals where succubi first showed up, and incubi were mentioned in the entry, mm-hmm. but never really shown. Right. We just we were just told, oh, there are male versions of succubi around. Same stats, but And if you saw the illustration and you were a 12-year-old boy or whatever, <laughs> you probably have that burned into your mind. Yes. Because it was a very scantily clad image, a very um, delicately positioned, uh, <laughs> shall we say, by the artist who, who created it. Right. Uh, but the idea of the succubus, the seducer, is another mythological creature that D&D just sort of picked up and brought to life. Yeah. D&D didn't invent succubi. They've been around for a They've long time. They've been around a long time. Right, so it was taking that idea. Exactly. And so here is this creature, and it was one, It was a demon. It was a chaotic, evil demon. Mm-hmm. It was a type of demon. And so it came out of the abyss. Uh, 
and there it remained until, uh, I believe it was fourth edition, when succubi were made into devils. Oh. The reason being that uh, the abyss was being more and more painted like a place where all sorts of chaotic monsters lived. There, there was no sort of unifying element of what a demon could be. They, were, they could be anything. But devils were very much humanoid, mm -hmm. often bat-winged, with horns, and a propensity for seduction or corruption. Which sounds which like is the exactly what the succubus sort of, that's its oeuvre. Yeah. And so they got sucked into being devils instead, which was a major change. And I'm not sure, not everybody were, were ready for that kind of magnitude of change in such a creature that gets a lot of play. Yeah. Uh, but it fit. And I think people started to come around. When fifth edition rolled around, we had a tough choice because our normal fifth edition philosophy is if a creature was something for most of the game's history, we would put that back where it was yeah. and make and sort of go that way. It's unusual since the succubus was only a devil for a relatively short amount of time in D&D's history. Yeah. It, the urge would have been to make it a demon again. But we thought, given its propensity for seduction, given its propensity for corruption, that it, it's still... It, Demon didn't feel quite right. So mm. what we decided to instead do was say, they play both sides. Mm. Um, they're neither demons nor devils, per se. They are a strange fiend. And uh, you can find them in any of the lower planes, the abyss, nine hells, wherever. Mm -hmm. And we also um, wanted to make sure that the incubus got inc equal time and, and paint the impression that it's not succubus, incubus, it's... Succubi and incubi, equal numbers throughout the cosmos. Right. And you can use both freely. And uh, so the, the question I have about that is Grast, the demon lord of yes. suggest, su seduction, yes. or, or at least, you know, copulation, <laughs> right. uh, yeah. seems to fit that the most uh, incubi or succubi would be. And, and in, in fact, yes, his court is probably has more, uh, uh, more of those creatures than any other evil entity in the cosmos. Right. Uh, they gravitate toward him greatly. and But there are other demon lords that have succubi and incubi as well, like Malkintheth, for, I can think of, for, for example. She's sure. a succubus queen, basically. Uh, but, yes, and, and the story of Grast, as he's been sort of recast over the years, has made that possible by saying he was originally a devil, hmm. but he was a devil who was sent to bring order to the abyss and decided, you know what? Screw I like it. it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it down here. Yeah. yeah. There's, I'm there's... going to carve out a domain for myself, and I'm never going to get one in the Nine Hells, so, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Right. I didn't realize that it's a, it's a, almost yeah. a very similar story to uh, what's going on with Baldur's Gate, Descent into Avernus, with mm. uh, the, the... Yeah, in some, re in some respects, he's an interesting um, foil. counterpoint or foil to her. Her going into hell to set things right and end the blood war and bring the, the wrath of good down upon the heads of evil. Yeah. Him going from one evil place to another evil place to bring that in line, to tame that chaos, and realizing he's kind of got a little bit of the chaos in himself and right. he can make a home there. I'm gonna ride the chaos. There is a similarity. I hadn't really think, thought about that before, but you're, you're absolutely right. These I like two that. are very alike. Um, uh, so that's Zeriel is the celestial who went down and is in uh, Avernus now. She rules the first layer of Avernus. Exactly. Uh, and so, yeah. Uh, so the, um, are there devils who employ uh, incubi or succubi? Frequently, yes. Because the wonderful thing about uh, succubi and incubi is they're shape changers. Mm -hmm. So they can assume the form of people and insinuate themselves into pretty much anywhere. Their charisma makes them easy to like, and so they can get, you know, they might be the person standing next to the king. Uh, there is a succubus who currently rules the town of Daggerford uh, ne near Waterdeep. Wow. Nobody knows that, uh, but uh, she's basically taken charge there, and everybody thinks she's just a human. When, uh, wh where is that dramatized? That is dramatized in an adventure called Ghosts of Dragon Spear Castle, mm. which we released between 4th and 5th editions. Ah, that makes sense to, yeah. to try to... Uh, so that's still, the that's still hanging out there. And uh, so they can show up anywhere. Uh, among their, in addition to their shape-changing abilities, as we know, succubi have their kiss mm. and incubi have their kiss. It is what they lay on you to basically stupefy you and turn you into a thrall. 
it becomes a, uh, a a charm, or is it more? It it's a it's a now you do what I say kind of thing. I see. I've tricked you into and and actually it's it's, it's painful. You take damage from it. You could die from a succubus's kiss before you ever get a chance to serve it. I see. If you're too weak, I, uh, and that's no kiss bueno. of death. Right. Yeah. Um, are are all humanoids susceptible to that? I believe so. Yeah. Mm. Um, so just the trick is don't kiss anybody ever <laughs> <laughs> in D and D. It's just a good good policy. Oh, but there's so many know. stories that won't get told. We were talking about Ak Inker earlier, and that was yes. one of the favorite. Favorite moments for fans is when Jim Dark Magic and uh, Succubus had a nice big sweet kiss. They sure did. Yeah, uh, that didn't end well for Jim. <laughs> I think he died. Well, pretty close to died. Right. Yeah. That's a lot of damage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So if you're if you're playing any one of these uh, uh, fiends or using them in your in your game, uh, you know we've already gone through the kind of their abilities. The, the, but the through line here is uh, guile, and uh, all of them have that in abundance. Yeah. It's just what flavor of guile do you want? And how to dramatize those is uh, always a fun yes. exercise. Just remember they're all terrible at heart. The worst of the worst. So use your use your evil skills yes. uh, to portray them. Anything the right they way. say that even strikes you as remotely philanthropic is all right. BS. But because they're such wonderful deceivers, yes. you don't know that you know the power in these creatures comes when the player characters don't know what they're dealing with. Right. Yes. Yeah. There. There are surprises. Yeah. They all take on other forms. They all hide their true selves. Yeah. And, and they're they're comfortable on the material plane as well as uh, they're comfortable the in their skin and yours. <laughs> 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 well, I feel like that's a uh, horrible place to end, but I think that's where we're going to do it. Uh, thank you, Chris, for, for all of that. Uh, how can people get in touch with you to ask you more about uh, your, your evil skin? I am on my evil skin. I'm on Twitter <laughs> at Chris Perkins DND. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. We'll be back with some more segments next week. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody uh, watching on Twitch. You are fantastic. This has been four hours of recording. <laughs> uh, we will not be doing a recording next week. So that's one of the reasons why we're trying to cram so much in. It's uh, Friday, July 5th here in the U.S. So uh, there, I guess our office is still technically open, but not many people are going to be here, uh, I'm going to say. So uh, we will be back doing live recordings uh, two weeks from today on Friday. Does that sound like a plan? What are you looking at me for, Pelham? You were like looking at me oddly. Next week is not the Oh, it's not? Next week is the week. Oh. I know how calendars work. We'll be back next week. <laughs> Ian, Laurie, and Rand Fishkin, two business folks from here in Seattle who play D&D a lot, uh, which I can't wait to pick their brains about. Uh, so cancel everything I just said, <laughs> and I'll say that again uh, when, we, when we start shutting down next week. Man, is there really a whole other week? I really thought it was July 4th yeah. next week. Mm -hmm. yeah, all right, well, time, time is an illusion. Time. Lunchtime, doubly so. Thank you guys so much. We don't have the Binwins uh, plays Idol Champions to throw it to right now, but I'm sure there is a, uh, a VOD of something. If not, there is always amazing things happening on the D&D Twitch channel. Look for Rivals of Waterdeep this week playing through the Gardens of Fog adventure that we talked about uh, in, in the first interview going on here. So that should be a lot of fun. Uh, thanks, everybody. We'll see you around. Bye-bye. <laughs>